This is lecture four for biology 178 on hearing and equilibrium. And who's that wonderful looking band on stage? That is the German folk metal band, Equilibrium. I hope you enjoyed that poorly recorded track from Equilibrium, but to get down to business and some of the information that we'll actually be covering, we're gonna be, of course, talking about the special senses of hearing in equilibrium. These are gonna be located inside the inner ear and they rely on a specialized mechanoreceptor called a hair cell. Hair cells are named as such because on their apical surface, they have specialized processes called stereocilia and in some cases, kinocilium. Stereocilia are similar to uh, microvilli or cilia. They're long finger-like protrusions that extend off of the surface of the cell. But unlike microvilli or cilia, these projections are not actively moved by the hair itself. They respond to the movement of fluid around it, thereby interpreting the vibration from the fluid and transmitting that information through the mechanoreceptor cell, the hair cell, into a sensory receptor cell. Now each hair cell is in intimate contact with the dendrite of that sensory neuron via chemical synapse. Distortion of those stereocilia, like I said, would cause a release of excitatory neurotransmitters onto the sensory neuron. Hair cells only respond to distortion. The more complex sensory structure they are housed in determines whether the signal being transduced is sound or gravity and acceleration and rotation. Kinocilium are actually going to be the larger overall structure that would determine if it is movement. They would be found primarily in the vestibule and semicircular canals that we'll get on into. Here we can see this diagram of a hair cell. Notice that it's in that intimate contact with the dendrite of a sensory neuron. The hair cell itself, the hairs of the hair cell are gonna be surrounded by fluid inside the inner ear. This extracellular fluid is moved in given directions, which causes a movement of the stereocilia, and in some cases, the kinocilium. This movement, like I said, is going to be transmitted to the dendrite of the sensory neuron and will be interpreted as movement or sound and give information about this uh, sort of stimulus. Here we can see a nice extension of the stereocilia of the hair cell as it extends up from the supporting cells in an electron microscope picture. Now, we understand we have the hair cell and we'll get more into the function of the hair cell in some of the later parts of this lecture, but we're gonna start with just looking at the ear and some of its major gross anatomical structures. The ear itself is divided into the external, middle, and inner ear. The external ear is the visible portion of the ear, and it collects and directs sound waves towards the middle ear. We have, of course, the auricle. That's going to be your outer ear that you can grab, and you might have some piercings in it as well. That is composed of elastic cartilage, meaning you can bend and distort it, and it bounces back to its original shape. The ear is one of the few places that we have extensive amounts of elastic cartilage in the body. There is then the external acoustic medius, and you should remember this a little bit from Biology 177 when we talked about the skull. The external acoustic medius is simply the passageway within the temporal bone that will lead into the inner ear. There is skin lining this passageway that contains ceremonious glands. These, of course, are going to secrete waxy cerumen, more commonly known of as earwax. There are many small outward projecting hairs, the different ear hairs, and this cerumen and hairs provide protection against entering foreign objects, insects, and microorganisms. They're entirely designed to try to prevent stuff from getting too far in. Here we can see a diagram of the auricle and the external acoustic medius that leads back. Once we reach the tympanic membrane, we've actually entered into the middle ear. So moving into the middle ear, we get into the auditory tube. This is also called the pharyngeotympanic tube or the astuchian tube, and it connects the middle ear to the nasopharynx. It allows for the equalization of pressure on both sides. This is why you have to pop your ears when you go up in altitude, like in a plane or something like that. And you typically do this through yawning. 
It can also allow microorganisms to invade in this area, and this can cause infection of the odious media. And the odious media is more commonly known of as an ear infection. This is bacteria that can migrate from the nasopharynx to the tympanic cavity. This is, of course, more common in children due to the short, broad nature of the early tube. Now, take a look here in the middle ear. We can see the tympanic membrane and then the auditory tube that would connect down to the nasopharynx. This is, of course, going to lead up to the tympanic cavity that would house the auditory ossicles or ear bones. We'll talk a little bit more about these, but these ear bones are going to link directly to the inner ear and transmit vibration. Talking about a few of the structures inside the tympanic cavity, we have the tympanic membrane, which we've already talked about. It is a thin, semi-transparent sheet that is designed to separate the external ear from the middle ear. You can think about it like the skin of a drum, in that it's going to actually deal with the vibration of sound that comes in and be the initial eardrum that would transmit that information throughout the rest of the inner ear. It is going to transmit that via auditory ossicles. These are three tiny bones, the smallest bones in the body that connect the tympanic membrane all the way to the structure known as the cochlea. They go in order, malleus, incus, and stapes. The auditory ossicles have the smallest synovial joints in the body, so they are a synovial joint and they go the order malleus incus stapes. Malleus, you can also remember as hammer, and it attaches to the tympanic membrane. The incus is the anvil, and this attaches the malleus to the next bone, the stapes or stirrup. This is bound to the oval window of the cochlea and is also connected to the incus. Here we can see a more detailed closer up view of the auditory ossicles in their order, the malleus, incus, and stapes. Now take note of two muscles there that are going to help to protect the apparatus from violent movements, the tensor tympani and the stapedus. The tensor tympani muscle connects the malleus to the temporal bone. Contraction of this is going to stiffen the tympanic membrane, reducing the amount of vibration. So it's controlling vibration during loud noise. The stapedus muscle is going to insert on the stapes and reduces movement at the oval window. And this is going to actually be controlled via the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7. So these two muscles, their entire function is to help deal with excessively loud noises. That's why an initial loud noise causes physical pain and then things equal out because the muscles engage reflexively. Here we can see the smallest synovial joints of the incus connecting to the stapes. The stapes would, of course, connect to the oval window, which is not present there on the cochlea. And then we can see a minor view of the tendon of the stapedus muscle. The middle ear ends at the stapes, and the stapes will then connect to a, an overall structure we call the bony labyrinth. The bony labyrinth is part of the internal ear, and this is going to contain the sensory organs for hearing and equilibrium. Now, the superficial contours are established by the layers of bone, and that's what we call this the bony labyrinth. Inside the bony labyrinth is gonna be the membranous labyrinth that we'll get to. And this is simply a network of canals. So here we can actually see that diagram again where we've gone from the external ear to the middle ear, and now we're looking at the internal ear. The internal ear structure has a bony labyrinth that is going to consist of three primary areas that we'll focus on. You can see the semicircular canals labeled. From the semicircular canals, it's unlabeled in this diagram, but it moves into a small bulb. That bulb right there is actually going to be the vestibule. From there, we go into the shell that looks like this kind of nautilus shell that's just curling around itself that says bony labyrinth. That's actually specifically going to be the cochlea. Understand that the bony labyrinth is actually this entire structure inside the internal ear. The bony labyrinth is a shell of dense bone, and it surrounds and protects the membranous labyrinth. The space between the bony labyrinth and the membranous labyrinth is filled with perilymph. You can imagine this a little bit, the bony labyrinth, like a, an egg. If you crack the egg, inside there's going to be egg white with an egg yolk in the center. 
That's the same principle I want you to think of with this bony labyrinth. The outer shell, the bone, is going to house the egg white or paralymph. On the inside would be the yolk. The yolk would represent the membranous labyrinth and inside is going to be another substance called endolymph. The actual bony labyrinth consists of three named parts, the semicircular canal, the vestibule, and the cochlea. This is a great diagram to show you the bony labyrinth portion and the membranous labyrinth portion. I want you to take a look at the bottom left corner. Here we can actually see the layering. Just like I said, it's like an egg. The bony labyrinth is the shell, the paralymph is the egg white, and then we have the membranous labyrinth, that's the egg yolk with the fluid of the endolymph inside of it. Now let's expand out to the larger picture. The bony labyrinth itself is going to be composed of the semicircular canals, those three loops up at the top, the vestibule, which is going to be the little bulbs that extend down from the semicircular canals, and then the large curved shell of the cochlea. Now, these same areas have a slightly different name when referring to their internal structures called the membranous labyrinth. These internal structures are going to be the semicircular ducts, the utricle and saccule, and the cochlear duct. These would represent the semicircular canals, vestibule, and cochlea membranous portions, respectively. So the membranous labyrinth, like I said, is a collection of fluid-filled tubes and chambers. It houses receptors for hearing and equilibrium. The hearing portion is actually going to be within the cochlear duct, and equilibrium is going to be a combination of the semicircular ducts and the utricle and saccule. The fluid contained inside is endolymph. It's identical in composition to the paralymph. It's just simply the name of it because it's inside the membranous labyrinth. These three parts are the semicircular ducts, which will deal with uh, rotation of the head. Those are gonna be contained within the semicircular canals. The utricle and saccule, which are contained within the vestibule. These deal with sensations of gravity and linear acceleration. And then the cochlear duct, which is going to deal with sound. Now, as we break down hearing and equilibrium, we'll start, of course, with hearing. But hearing itself is the interpretation of sound. Now, sound, sound itself is really just pressure waves that result in the vibration and displacement of air or water. In air, pressure waves create alternating areas of compressed and separated molecules. This creates what we know of as wavelengths. And a wavelength of sound is the distance between two adjacent wave crests or peaks or between two adjacent troughs. Hearing is simply the perception of these displacements and vibration. Interpreting sound is the job of the cochlear duct, which remember is a long coiled tube that is filled with endolymph. It lies between a pair of perilymphatic chambers, the vestibular duct and the tympanic duct. The vestibular duct is separated from the cochlear duct by the vestibular membrane. The tympanic duct is separated from the cochlear duct by the basilar membrane. So there are two membranes that will, these membranes will separate these two ducts from the cochlear duct. Both ducts interconnect at the tip of the cochlear spiral, creating one long chamber. This begins at the oval window, known as the scala vestibuli, and ends at the round window, the base of the scala tympani. Vestibuli would actually be at the very base of the vestibular membrane and scala tympani is going to be at the base of the tympanic duct. The hair cells for hearing are located inside the organ of corti, of the spiral organ. This is going to be on the basilar membrane inside the cochlear duct. To help you get a better sense of the organization inside the cochlear duct, we actually need to look back at the bony labyrinth and separate out the cochlea. You can see the cochlea in its spiral-like shape. We're simply going to cut that in half. It's like cutting in half a cinnamon roll. We're going to then separate it out, and we can see the three different ducts. Remember, the order of the ducts will go vestibular, cochlear, tympanic. The vestibular duct is going to, the vestibular duct and the tympanic duct both have paralymph inside of them. The cochlear duct has endolymph inside of them. The cochlear duct additionally is going to house the major functional structure of the cochlea called the organ of corti.
the organ of corti has hair cells arranged in longitudinal rows that are embedded in the basilar membrane and the stereocilia are in direct contact with an overlying tectorial membrane. The sound waves will cause pressure waves within the paralymph vibrating the basilar membrane, so the basement of where these hair cells are gonna be actually stuck into. This will cause the stereocilia to press into the tectorial membrane above them and then distort those stereocilia. This causes the stimulation of sensory neurons that relay the message via the cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve or cranial nerve eight. More movement equals more hair cells stimulated. And this is typically triggered by a louder sound. Here we've zoomed in on one specific cavity of the cochlea to look at a few of the details. Here again, you can see the vestibular duct up top, the tympanic duct there on the bottom, and then the cochlear duct in the middle. You can also see the organ of corti in that little square. Let's zoom in on the organ of corti and take a look at it. You can see the hair cells are actually embedded directly in the basilar membrane. And those stereocilia that extend up are then embedded in that tongue looking thing called the tectorial membrane. Remember that the basilar membrane is what gets distorted to push the stereocilia up against the tectorial membrane. The tectorial membrane doesn't move. So this is a good diagram to show you what the actual hair cells in the organ of corti look like at rest. And then sound happens. This causes pressure wave to go throughout the paralymph and then pushes those stereocilia up against the tectorial membrane. This would cause an excitatory neuron, an excitatory action potential to occur, thus stimulating that sensory neuron. Here we can see an electron microscope view of the hair cells with their stereocilia embedded in the tectorial membrane above. Now I've been to a number of concerts in my life and if I can tell you one thing about going to concerts, it's bring earplugs. You will not enjoy the music any less, I promise you, and you will be able to keep your hearing a little bit longer. Here we can see on the left are nice, normal, healthy hair cells that extend up through all the stereocilia in those hair cells and then maybe a bad concert night, right? No earplugs right next to the front stage, the speakers, everything. Too long of an exposure to too intensive a sound wave can actually cause permanent damage to their hair cells. Over time, this could lead to different forms of deafness as well. Now that we've covered all of the major structures of the ear, we can actually go through the events that are involved in hearing. It begins with the sound or pressure vibration waves funneled into our external auditory canal through our auricle. That's one. Two, the pressure waves are going to cause the tympanic membrane to vibrate like the face of a drum. This will then three, stimulate the movement of all of the auditory ossicles malleus, incus, and stapes in that order that will vibrate eventually to get to the opening known of as the oval window. Too much vibration or too sudden will be dampened by a reflex involving the tensor tympani or stapitus muscles controlled by the cranial nerves. Moving on from this, now that we've vibrated the oval window, step four, vibrations at the oval window initiate pressure waves in the vestibular duct. The pressure waves in the vestibular duct continue to the end of the spiral, where they then continue through the tympanic duct. Because liquids are not compressible, the only way to relieve pressure waves is at the round window at the other end of the vestibular duct. So we go from the oval window all the way around to the round window. These pressure waves, as they travel throughout, are going, are going to actually vibrate the basilar membrane. The vibration of the basilar membrane is then going to push the stereocilia of the hair cells up against the tectorial membrane in the cochlear duct. The stimulation of these hair cells will release neurotransmitters onto sensory neurons. The greater the vibration, the more hair cells that are stimulated. This should give you another visualization of how we hear things differently as sound waves move through the cochlea through the oval window and then out to the round window. Here we can actually see sound waves move through and distort 
the basilar membrane as it moves through the round window in one direction or through the other direction. This works in many ways like a guitar string, where we can strum it in one direction or change the note by strumming in the other direction. The different pressure wave frequency is going to dictate how it actually vibrates the basilar membrane and how we interpret the different sound notes that move throughout. So really, all instruments are very much the same and function on the same principle of controlling vibrations at different frequencies. From hearing, we will now move on to equilibrium. Our sense of equilibrium is divided into the semicircular ducts and the utricle and saccule. The semicircular ducts are going to control rotation and head proprioception, so we understand our head's position in space. The utricle and saccule deal with gravity and linear acceleration. To revisit the diagram and remind ourselves of where this is, remember that the semicircular ducts are within the semicircular canals. We have three of these semicircular ducts slash canals. Then at the base of these, separating the semicircular canals from the cochlea is going to be the vestibule. And inside the vestibule is the utricle and saccule. We'll talk first about the semicircular ducts. Remember that they're going to deal with rotation and head position. There are three ducts, anterior, posterior, and lateral. These are continuous with the utricle, and they are filled with endolymph. At the very base of each, just before they get to the vestibule, there is an enlarged region of the semicircular ducts. This is called the ampulla. Kinocelia and stereocelia hair cells are embedded within a cupula that is inside this ampulla. The cupula itself is a flexible, elastic, gelatinous structure extending the width of the ampulla. So again, fluid throughout the entire duct, and then at the base of the duct and the ampulla is going to be where the hair cell is located. Here we can see the hair cell is going to be located at the very base of the semicircular ducts at the ampulla. Inside, we can see it's going to look like this, where we have a cupula, a large gelatinous structure that surrounds the hair cells with endolymph surrounding the cupula. This is designed to kind of filter too much movement. I want you to take note of the anterior semicircular canal, the posterior semicircular canal, and then the lateral that will jut out to the side. Each one will have its own cupula and its own hair cells within it that are going to deal with different positions of the head. So how do these semicircular ducts work? Well, each duct is actually going to deal with a different plane of movement of the head. Now, as you rotate the head with one, this will actually move the endolymph inside one of these semicircular ducts, pushing the cupula to the side and causing distortion of the hair cells. Movement one way can cause stimulation of one set of ampulla, whereas the opposite movement causes inhibition. At the end of the movement, the cupula will rebound to the normal position when the endolymph stops moving. Like I said, each one of the semicircular ducts is going to deal with a different head position. We'll start with the anterior semicircular duct that would actually appear quite vertical. This is going to deal with the head moving down and up through flexion and extension. So think of saying yes or nodding yes with your head. This is going to activate the anterior semicircular duct. The next would be the lateral semicircular duct. This would actually extend out to the side. This is going to be activated when you turn your head and rotate it, like you're nodding your head no. You're shaking your head no, excuse me. The last one is extending off to the side at a slight angle, and this is the posterior semicircular canal. This one is activated by tilting the head side to side. So like going, I'm not sure, going side to side. So this will show you the different positions and how each one of the semicircular ducts deals with a different head position. The final structures to talk about are inside the vestibule. This is going to be the utricle and the saccule. These provide equilibrium sensations whether the body is stationary or moving. It gives us awareness of gravity and acceleration. They are connected by slender passageways to each other and to the endolymphatic sac, where endolymph is actually produced inside the inner ear. The utricle and saccule contain hair cells that are clustered together. A cluster of hair cells in the utricle and saccule are called a maculae. 
Hair cells of the utricle are going to project vertically. Hair cells of the saccule are going to project laterally out to the side. The hair cell processes of these maculae are going to be embedded in a gelatinous mass called the autolithic membrane. So remember, the hair cells are going to be in like a basement membrane stuck there, and they have the stericilia and kinocilium that are going to extend up into a gelatinous mass, the autolithic membrane. On top of the autolithic membrane is going to be carbonate crystals called autoliths, calcium carbonate crystals. These are your ear stones. They detect movement and pressure. This is going to be the utricle and saccule. Here we can see a macula. Remember, a macula is simply a cluster of hair cells inside the utricle and saccule. Now, this is really cool how this works. Anytime we actually deal with acceleration or gravity, we have the rocks that will actually push down or move on the actual surface of the autolithic membrane. So these kind of ear stones almost work like that little leveling bubble in one of those leveling rulers, and that the rocks move, or the fluid, the endolymph is actually gonna move the rocks, the rocks are gonna move the membrane, and the membrane moves the hair cells. So this is thereby going to stimulate those sensory neurons so you can interpret gravity, the pressure of gravity, or the direction of movement that you're going. Here we can actually see where the crystals are removed up top and we can see the kinocelium as they projection. And then in the bottom there, we can see all the crystals intact. Everything's covered on that autolithic membrane. So how does all this work? Well, changes in the position of the head cause distortion of the hair cell processes in the macula, sending signals to the brain. With the head in an upright position, the autoliths are gonna sit on top of the autolithic membrane in the utricle. So if we say got into an elevator, you know when an elevator is going down, if you jump up slightly, you'll actually feel your body lighter. Or even just going down without jumping, you'll feel all of a sudden that your body is lighter. This is because the autoliths are actually moving up away from the autolithic membrane, so weight is not compressing the hair cells. But naturally, in our environment where we have gravity, we have a, a light amount of weight that is pressing down on these hair cells, compressing the cells but not bending them. This gives us our sensation of gravity and pressure. Now let's talk a little bit about acceleration. With the tilted position or with linear movement, gravity is going to pull the autoliths in a given direction, shifting them to the side. This movement is going to distort the hair cell processes, stimulating macular receptors. This is how distortion of the hair cells are actually going to look during movement. So we have gravity constantly pushing down on us, and if I tilt my head or if I'm running in a given direction, gravity would actually still be pushing down, and the autolith is going to slide back bending the hair cells. This would cause an interpretation of my body of I'm moving up or my body is moving in that given direction. The same is true if I'm just running straight in linear acceleration. I'd feel a pull on the autoliths in the opposite direction that would bend the hair cells. So without gravity, we don't have a sensation of where we are in space. So if you're ever, if you ever get a chance to go up in an anti-gravity kind of force, it's going to feel a little bit different. You won't have the same kind of orientation because we rely on gravity so much to move the autoliths and give us awareness and equilibrium. And that'll be it for this lecture. Our next lecture is covering vision.